This is Leadership for Society, the Race and Power Conversation Series, and I am Brian Lowry, and I'm really happy to be joined today by the former U.S. Attorney General Loretta Lynch. Thanks for joining us, A.G. Thank you so much for having me, Brian. Great. So this is a, a really um, fortuitous or maybe not so fortuitous time to ha have you here, <laughs> um, given what's happening in the country today. So um, the first thing I want to ask you is, uh, how do we talk about the um, events of this past Wednesday? Like, what do we call it? Is it a riot? Is it a coup attempt? Is it a terrorist event? Is it an insurrection? How should we talk about it? What happened? So, you know, it's one of those events that frankly calls forth all of those terms. It was a concerted, deliberate effort designed to prevent the lawful transfer of power from one administration to another. Um, and while, you know, a number of people who visited, who, who were there are now all over social media saying, oh, I had no idea, and oh, I'm just a patriot, um, you can see the order uh, coalescing in the crowd. You can see the people who came prepared to take action. You can see the group come together. You can see a mob mentality take over the entire group, regardless of their intention when they got to the Capitol. And frankly, they were incited and in fact directed to go to the Capitol and try and make sure something happened. And when you have a group of people who by force um, try and either overthrow a branch of government or prevent the orderly transfer of power from one administration to another, um, you have an attempted coup. And had it succeeded, we would have had only the second one to occur on American soil. The first one occurring um, several years ago, 1898, in Wilmington, North Carolina, which has been talked about a lot more now, uh, probably than it ever has been since it occurred. But it was definitely an attempt to prevent a constitutional process that would have determined who the next president and administration was. So yes, attempted coup insurrection, an attempt to violently overthrow the U.S. government. Violence was planned, violence was used, uh, a mob, a protest, all of those things apply. Okay, let's, let's talk about a little bit more from the uh, perspective of race. So I, I think I, I told you this already that this is a bit personal for me and a number of people I've talked to about this. So I would say Black people in this country have shown a commitment to the United States despite being enslaved, being lynched, being overlooked, except when demonized. But here what you see is that the first hint of the sense that the country is moving away from them or a sense that it, something has gone awry from their perspective, this mostly white mob broke into, reportedly defecated in the Capitol building, carried Confederate flags, their reports of pipe bombs, and yet many of them just walked out of the building without being arrested. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty sure this would not have happened had that mob been black. Um, they let a president like Joe, Joe Biden said as much. But I think really the kicker for me is that if that had happened and it had been a black mob, I would have woken up on Thursday afraid for my safety and the safety of my family. I, I, there's in my mind a good chance there would have been vigilantes and even police who would have been looking to hurt black people or any other ethnic group for that matter who had engaged in that um, other than the white crowd um, that was there or to just blame black people for it. We saw mm -hmm. that after 9-11, when anyone who was remotely assumed to be of Arab or even Muslim connection or descent was blamed and often beaten. We've seen it when other events have occurred, when there have been black protests, and then there's a backlash, often in wholly unrelated areas to wholly mm -hmm. unrelated people. So, so you're absolutely right about that. You know, I, I, it's, I, I think you're right to take it personally. I think people will, will take it in, in a number of ways. And certainly a number of, uh, of Black people are going to view it in exactly that lens. I think you have to step back and, and really see it from an even further point of view, because this really didn't, this didn't start last Wednesday. This is the culmination of years of planning on the part of individuals who really don't fear uh, retribution. They have no concern about being held accountable because they rarely are held accountable. And they are also not characterized as the violent groups that, that they are, even though for the last several years, at least the past decade, if not more, there have been more acts of concerted organized violence within the United States perpetrated by white supremacist groups uh, than there have been by either foreign nationals 
or, uh, or African American affiliated groups where the violence is actually quite low. So, but, the, but it's the perception. Because the difference had the group been primarily black, we've already seen. So we saw last summer with Black Lives Matter protests. And th this is with a multicultural and diverse group of people mm -hmm. joining Black Lives Matter to protest. The, the difference begins with the perception. The perception on the part of law enforcement is that this is a group that could easily turn violent like that. That's the expectation and that's the planning that goes into it. And so you may have seen also last week a number of people sharing photos of preparations for the Black Lives Matters marches in Washington last summer, where National Guard and um, officers in riot gear were already standing at monuments to protect them before the protests began. What typically happens when you have a protest of any kind, or even a large organization or group, like for example, when the United Nations comes to New York, um, it engenders protests, but there's, there's weeks of planning that goes into effect. And sometimes it's logistical, like where's traffic gonna go? Often it's law enforcement. What is the threat assessment of this group and of this particular activity? And so clearly the threat assessment for the activity last Wednesday was considerably lower than it was for Black Lives Matter protest. You didn't have National Guard standing by. You didn't have police officers already summoned. And what we've heard from people who were deeply involved in the, in, in the aftermath of it um, is that um, the Capitol Police were calling out for the National Guard to come, but because they hadn't been arranged for in advance, the bureaucracy of that took hours. They were calling for other law enforcement agencies to come and help them because clearly they were overrun. They were clearly being attacked. Um, and it just, the time that it takes to get that up and running is actually often several hours. But when, when, when there's a, a protest involving mostly black protesters, those preparations are made in advance. Why? Because large groups of black people are perceived to be a threat at the outset whereas large groups of white individuals usually are not perceived to be a threat. When in fact, intelligence, which is what we are supposed to rely on in determining your threat assessment, tells us that this group in, in particular was a threat and that very, very often large groups of, of, of white individuals, particularly if they have neo-Nazi white supremacist connections, are also a threat. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I was going to ask you about that. There's been a lot of um, discussion about the growing threats of white supremacist groups, but not so much, it seems to be, um, response to that or preparation for that. And I think it's that disparity that's causing a lot of discomfort among people that I know. Mm -hmm. So I'm on the family chat. One of my cousins wrote, we have to keep it real with our kids. They are not free. Nothing has changed. Just changed how it's brought to us. Brought to us. My heart hurts. And what, what would you, so you were at the highest levels of the U.S. government in charge of the Justice Department of the government. What, what should my cousin tell her kids? What would you tell you, I don't know if you have young kids or if you have kids, what, what do you tell them about the state of the country at this point? You know, I think, I think you have to reiterate, we have to reiterate the messages to our children that we've always shared with them, that, that this is a country that was founded on, on tremendous ideals and that the struggle this country has always faced is living up to those ideals, particularly when um, the comfort of some groups stand in the way of those ideals. At what point um, do we continue to defer to the comfort and, and fear of making certain groups uncomfortable when it comes to the rights of others? Because what we've seen throughout history is, and particularly if you look at the African-American journey through this country, is that whenever there is a big push uh, and there are significant steps forward to advance black equality just to get the country to live up to its founding ideals, there's a backlash. You know, it's, it's as predictable as the sunrise. Um, and we've been in the middle of one now for the past four years, if not longer. It really began when the former President uh, Obama was elected. Um, so, you know, I think we tell our children uh, what the world is really like. But I think we also have to tell them that, you know, there's always people who believe that this country can be better than it is. Um, and they push and they work to make it better every day. I think, obviously, what happened last Wednesday was a tragedy. Loss of life 
harm to people, desecration of the Capitol. But you know the other tragedy of last Wednesday, Brian? It's a day that we should have been celebrating the fact that in the state of Georgia, a state that frankly embodies the painful legacy of race in this country, that state managed to turn away from that legacy. Whether it's just for a day or a few years, we don't know, but they turned away from that legacy and they elected a black man to be the senator from the state of Georgia. And they elected his colleague, a Jewish American individual, to be the senator from the state of Georgia. And we should have been celebrating that you know, we should have been holding that up as an example that, you know what, we don't always get it right. We don't always hold on to the gains that we have made. But there are times when we can come together and after years of work and dedication, and exactly what you said, the, the push by African Americans to make democracy real, we actually made it happen. And instead, we're talking about the yahoos who stormed the Capitol because they're mad uh, and they think that their vote has been stolen. And I have to say, you know, I think I'm with you in many ways in taking it personally. As someone who comes from a long line of people who have had their votes stolen mm -hmm. and their voices ignored and, and elections rigged against them, it's really kind of insulting when we have one of the most secure and fair elections ever. Uh, on record by a bipartisan group of people to have this canard thrown up in our faces time and time again, particularly when, as you look at the, if you look at the actual arguments, the real basis for this argument that this election, the presidential election, I should say, was somehow rigged, was, be, was is always focusing on the, the urban areas where there are large numbers of black voters. Um, so, you know, we again come down to the point of view that the black vote shouldn't count the same, it shouldn't count as much. So you had this push and pull throughout history and throughout our country. And all of us, have, we've got to decide, you know, how do we live with that? And what do we tell our children? And I'll tell you what I tell my kids who are now young adults is that, look, you know, life is not always fair. There are not always going to be people who do the right thing, who want the right thing. But you have to decide for yourself, you know, what do you believe in? And what are you prepared to fight for? And I'm proud of the fact that I come from a long line of people who have fought for the ideals of this country since the beginning of it, ever since it was denied to us. People who have had liberty denied or taken away from them appreciate it so much more than those who are born to it and take it for granted. And I think what we've seen is that awakening in so many young people and people of color this summer, you know, the culmination of so many years of work in Georgia, you know, the realization of the power of the black vote, the realization of the power of black women, finally. You know, I mean, to see black women being recognized for the work that frankly, we have always done, just usually in the name of men, um, has been phenomenal. So I, I would tell my children to look at the things that we have accomplished and let no one take it away from us. I, I, um, I, I find that incredibly moving. So I, I, I agree with you that the people who have fought the hardest and had their rights taken away are most committed to justice in, in, the, in the present moment. And you see that, I think. But justice also requires a, um, a recognition of, of things that have done that are wrong. And so I'm curious what you think about um, how should we respond to incitement? So um, the president or others who have incited the kind of actions that we've seen and the continued threats that we face, how should we respond to that? Well, for any democracy to work, people have to perceive the system as being fair and even handed. And I think the challenge that we face and the challenge that so many of us who have worked in government and specifically in law enforcement like I have is that the system has not always been fair. It has not always been even handed. It is not always, I should say, fair and even handed. And I think when you have such a huge breach of trust and a huge breach of responsibility, as we saw last week, the two bywords that we have to hold on to are transparency and accountability. We have to have an accounting of what happened. We have to do a full examination of all the flaws, both logistical and legal. We also have to decide who's responsible for these tremendous acts of violence that we saw and hold them accountable. That's beginning. You know, we're seeing people arrested. We're seeing the process uh, begin to work. We're seeing other types of accountability also. Keep in mind that what was disrupted was an inherently political process. 
at the heart of our political system is the peaceful transfer of power. We are known for that throughout the world. Um, and you know, it is a political process that gets us to that point. And you're starting to see a political reckoning as well. How long that will last, you know, who knows? Uh, but you're starting to see that. You're starting to see, um, you know, there are reports of major corporations saying, you know what, we're going to be thinking long and hard about who we fund and who we support. And by the way, we'd like some of that money back um, to some people who stood up and made some rather outrageous statements on the floor of the Senate. So there's accountability at all different levels, and it comes from different places. There's social accountability. Some people are losing their jobs. Many people, I would believe, are losing their friends and acquaintances. Now, of course, the flip side is, it is clear that the far right is using the events of last Wednesday as a rallying and recruitment cry. Um, they are calling those who were injured martyrs. At least, you know, for example, one woman was shot and killed. A terrible tragedy to be sure, not something you want to have happen, but she is becoming a martyr to the cause and they are recruiting based on that. You know, this is what, this is what the far right does. This is what people who want to create protest mob, protests that turn into mobs do. What we have to do is essentially make sure that the systems that we have chosen and that we still hold on to for accountability in this country are in fact utilized. People have to be identified, they have to be prosecuted, their actions have to be investigated to the highest levels of government. We have said repeatedly in this country that no one is above the law, even the President of the United States. Now again, the presidency is a political position. So right now we're dealing with political solutions to that uh, in terms of what the House will do, what the Senate will do, and what those ramifications will be. But people have to see some sort of accountability for this behavior. And this isn't just, you know, people, uh, people who typically are on the Black Lives Matter protest side and know how different things will be. The country has to see accountability for this. There has to be a clear description of what happened, why it was wrong, and who's going to be held accountable. Or the next group is going to think, we can do the same thing. Hey, Angie, that's my biggest concern. Look, there's not a lot of fear among some politicians. In fact, they're betting on the possibility of increasing their base by mm -hmm. staying on the side of the people who were, in some sense, rioting. Doing it, you know, I mean, obviously there's a dance they do, but that seems to be the bet they're making. So, uh, how do we hold people accountable in this political environment, right? With the kind of partisanship where they can they can make mm -hmm. a bet on embracing the radical side of the the right and still mm -hmm. hold office. Well, this is why I think we have to really <clears throat> step back and see the larger picture here. Because holding people accountable, as I mentioned, comes in many, many ways. As individual accountability, will someone be prosecuted for their actions and literally held accountable? There's political accountability. Do you continue to receive the reward, the perks and rewards of your office? Do people continue to contribute money to you? Some people are gonna stop. Those contributions will dry up. On the other hand, we know. It may open contributions from others who share their views, but as a society, how do we hold people accountable in the political sphere? It's we determine um, at the ballot box. And again, it may not necessarily be an instantaneous process. I come back to the great achievements of Georgia. You know, Stacey Abrams herself will tell you, this was 10 years in the making, 10 years of work and organizing to turn Georgia blue, but she believed it could be done. And she and a, a group of, of dedicated, committed people worked at the grassroots level to get it done. So we've got to step back and think about, all right, how do we in fact maintain the political power, the power of the ballot that we have found? Um, and that frankly has been a goal of the civil rights movement since before the, the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act of 64. And it was the first goal. It was the first goal because King and Lowry and everybody else who was working so hard back then knew that with the ballot, you could put people in office who could change the policies. And so we've got to think about the barriers to the voting booth. And one of the things I think we have got to maintain our eye on is the fact that while this particular mob and insurrection was put down last week, and Lord knows I certainly hope that we can contain the violence that I fear is being planned for the next 10 days and on January 20th. But 
make no mistake about it, we are going to begin to hear out of people who say, well, we weren't able to advance this view of election fraud. You kept us from showing evidence, even though it isn't true. They will begin to use this to try and tighten up the ways in which people gain access to the ballot box. We will begin to hear rhetoric because we've always talked about in the context of this presidential election, look, you know, Republicans believe in states' rights. Um, and I mean that on many different levels. But the states run the elections and they set up rules for the elections. And many of the rules that are now being objected to were put in place by Republican legislatures. There will be a push to tighten up voting. I predict there will be a push to shorten early voting, to limit absentee and mail-in voting, to limit the places, the polling places, under the guise of preventing voter fraud. This, this unicorn has been chased for years. No one's ever seen it. I, I believe the Secretary of State of Georgia said they found two people whose votes were cast after they were deceased. And I remember um, in my home state of North Carolina, where this, this, again, this chimera of voting fraud was used to enact some incredibly strict voter ID laws when investigations were done as to the idea of who, in fact, who are the dead people that vote? Okay, usually it's somebody voting in their name. They found, again, two instances of Republican voters who were trying to cast a ballot for the current president. So, you know, not only is it not a widespread thing, it hasn't even benefited the Democratic Party in the way in which it's, it's accused of, of doing. But you will hear this, you will hear this. And so we have got to redouble our efforts to keep the path to the ballot box open. We have also now shown the power of the black vote. We have shown the power of organizing. This will generate a backlash. So it's my view that I, I think that the, the events of last Wednesday, as horrific as they are, are now set in stone. We have to work on holding those individuals accountable both individually and politically, but we have to look ahead to the challenges that we face. And I'm very, very concerned that we're gonna see some significant efforts, particularly at the state level, to limit the right to vote. So continued efforts, you mean, because as you said, this has been a, a long-term strategy for some of the Republican Party to try to limit voting in a number of places. And we already, we see um, it takes longer to vote in certain, especially heavily African-American yes. districts as well. So. I think this would just be the continuation of a, a long-term strategy. But I want to talk about accountability in terms of law enforcement and turn it around a little bit. So law enforcement right now is using really sophisticated surveillance to actually try to catch some of the people who were involved in the, the riot, the insurrection yeah. on the 6th. Um, and I, I sense there's going to be some support for the use of those tools because of who they're using it against. Um, but is there a reason to worry that, that that becomes normalized? Because as we know, as often the case, um, those things don't end up being used against the, the dominant majority group. Um, in the right, right. right. And, and I think look, one of the reasons why I think you see such national outrage here is because this was a largely white mob attacking a largely white body. Um, and people haven't seen that. I mean, they've, I mean, there was Oklahoma City, you know, the Oklahoma City bombing, but they didn't really see that on the national stage. So you're absolutely right. Um, look, I think um, a lot of, of surveillance tools um, have been developed that use technology to incredible, incredible extent. The problem is when you use them to replace uh, investigation and corroboration and confirmation, um, particularly if they're not accurate. You know, facial recognition is one tool um, that when it first began being touted as something that would help law enforcement, I mean, obviously, if, if someone has robbed a bank or killed someone or harmed a child, you do want to apprehend that person and you want to hold them accountable, but you want to get the right person. If you don't get the right person, you haven't helped anyone. You've committed another injustice and you've left a dangerous person out there to possibly harm someone again. And so I think people were very anxious and, and, and frankly hopeful that uh, tools like facial recognition would be useful. And we've seen that depending upon you know, who, how they're manufactured and who manufactures them and how they are programmed, that they may not be as accurate as they had initially been touted to be. It's really hard to get people to pull back from a tool when they've adopted it and they think it's great. 
you know, and law enforcement is no different from anybody else in this regard. Uh, but as we use this, this tool more and more, I think we are seeing that, you know, it, it cannot be the sole basis of identification. And even in, in the case of the Capitol riots, um, they're using other tools of techniques. Also, they're using cell phone data. Um, they, people, are, people are calling in tips. You know, I think someone's ex-wife called in and whole host of issues there, but <laughs> leaving that aside, um, I would say to that woman, well, you certainly dodged a bullet, didn't you? But uh, <laughs> literally, um, and so we have to be careful with these techniques that, they, that we don't assume that they answer the question for us. Uh, and in order to do that, with, as with every technique that we have, you have to have people in charge um, who have that judgment and that discretion at the ready. Uh, and that is a function of not just police training, but prosecutor training, judicial training, so that everyone in the system who's presented with this evidence knows how to truly evaluate it. Um, you know, there's a lot of great technological discoveries here. I mean, DNA evidence. DNA is, is, has been tremendously helpful and frankly has shown, um, and just look at the number of people who've been exonerated through DNA, for example, um, and as well as have been convicted and held accountable for their actions. Um, so that, but that was a tool that we had to learn to use. Uh, and so all of these technologies are the same. And, and so I, I think if you, if you talk to people who are very focused on civil liberties, you know, they can outline for you the concerns um, of a surveillance state. Um, and that voice has to be heard as well. Um, and you have to have a counterbalance to this as opposed to just, hey, here's this great new tool that we can use and solve everything because a tool never solves the problem for you. It just doesn't. Mm -hmm. When you think about um, the necessity of people who are using those tools being well-trained and being trustworthy, it, there's not a lot of trust, let's just say, in many communities for the people in police departments or prosecutor's offices. Um, and so how, how do you get those people to um, accept that this is actually going to serve them, that they are going to be guarded and not seen as a threat, right? That it's not going to be mm -hmm. a, another way simply to surveil certain subpopulations of the community, right. black and brown mm -hmm. folks, in right. service of keeping people who have resources safe. Well, you know, I think if you, if you view the role of law enforcement, um, I mean, it's always been sort of used in that way, which is, which is to keep people safe who have something and keep people who, who may not have as much away at, because of the perception that there's going to be tension there. It's going to be some kind of inherent problem there. Um, when in fact, what we've often seen is that the greatest amount of violence, I mean, look, there's indiv it's always individual violence, so a homicide or a robbery. But when it comes to institutional violence, um, usually it is marginalized people who are the victims. Um, in many, many ways. So, um, so that, that has to be kept in mind as well. But I think it goes back to the same words I use in, when talking about this, the specific of how to handle last week's events, transparency and accountability. And people have to press for that. Uh, and the time to press for it is before there's a law enforcement tragedy in your community. The time to press for it is when there's a new police chief coming on board, or when there's a new mayor who's gonna pick your new police chief coming on board, or even if there is, isn't an election, when there doesn't seem to be a particular hot spot going on. Hard to find that now, I know, I understand. Um, but even, but even so, that's the time to really press it. Um, because the, the, the whole environment changes once you're dealing with a tragedy, a shooting, um, you know, protests gone wrong. You still have to have dialogue then as well, but, before you can rebuild trust after a clash like that, you've got to resolve the, the individual and systemic issues of accountability. But the time to do it is, is, is when you, when hopefully before the event happens. Um, and when I was in office, we spent a lot of time talking to law enforcement departments who would come to the Department of Justice and they would say, you know, I'm looking at the demographics of my city. I'm looking at the economic disparity in my city and I see a powder keg and I don't want to be the next Ferguson. They would say this, you know, I don't want to be the next Ferguson. I, I want to avoid that. Can you give me some guidance? Can you give me some tools? Can you give me some help? 
And we did that. It was called Collaborative Reform. It was one of, one of the most successful programs that we had, uh, but it relied very heavily on not just a police department, but finding a community partner to hold that police department accountable. So let's say that you have a police department that is going to move into new technology. Now keep in mind that a lot of police departments still don't, aren't fully equipped with body cameras. You know, they're getting there, but they're still not fully equipped with body cameras. And when body cameras were first introduced, they wanted nothing to do with body cameras. Oh no, we don't need them. You know, we know what happened. They'll be in the way, they'll be an encumbrance. And now, not just community members, but law enforcement recognize that body cameras are an important way, not the only way, but they're an important way of providing clarity in, a, in volatile situations. They give everyone at least a third eye to do an observation of some of the events. They're not perfect. You know, they're not always pointed in the right direction. The volume isn't always on. Um, you know, they don't always turn on, turn them on early enough. But at least you have some clarity and you can at least see a little bit better. And what happens when you, you, we see what happens when police departments get body cameras is not only uh, do instances where police officers overstep drop, but, but community complaints against police officers drop as well. Um, both because there's a little bit less to complain about and also people can themselves see clearly what happened and decide whether or not this complaint is appropriate, maybe another way of dealing with it is appropriate as well. So as we get into technology, there needs to be a community group that, that knows, you know, what technology does your police department have? Do they have body cameras? If not, when is the city council gonna, gonna allocate money for them to get body cameras. If they have body cameras, do they have a method whereby you can go on the police department's website, for example, and just sort of see what they see? You know, some police departments have opened up their, their technology in a way that you can sign on and do a virtual ride along with a police officer in a car. You can see what they see through their body camera. You can see, you know, either they turn it off, obviously there's violence. Mm -hmm. If there's a victim, you gotta protect people's privacy. You think about things that you would not want exposed on camera. But there are ways to do this so that people can actually access what is happening. Do you, does your police department post the statistics on a daily or weekly basis of, of the things that really drive tension between law enforcement and the minority community, which are traffic stops, personal interactions, and the small everyday crimes that get reported like burglaries and robberies. Mm -hmm. Are those posted? Do you know where they are? Do you know where the police are going and why they're going there? Right. This strategy seems to put a lot of the onus on people who don't have a lot of time and resources, right? So the people in the communities that are being over-policed don't have a, an excess amount of time to, to do this. So that's one thing that causes me a little bit of concern here. The other thing is, before you say this, the time to do it is before a major event happens. But the reality is, at least in my experiences, it's harder to be heard mm -hmm. before a major event happens, right? So there's, there's not a lot of traction, which I think is pushing toward a lot of people um, moving toward this defund the police movement. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious what your attitude is um, toward that approach to that that movement. Right. Well, just to, to your first earlier points, they're excellent points. Uh, and I don't mean to imply that every community member has to be the one signing on every day to check this up. This is why you elect people who have your interests at heart. Mm -hmm. This is why you have a city council that listens to you at the block party. That's their job. Now, you should be able to go onto their website and see it for yourself, but that's, that's, those are the jobs of your elected officials. And that's why you've got to put people in office who focus on these issues and who will listen to you. And frankly, yeah, it is the responsibility of every citizen to vote. So I, I am putting that on people. I will put that on every eligible individual in this country, particularly every person of color. I will put that responsibility on them to vote. But I also think that we have to look at larger organizations that are looking at gerrymandering, for example, where you may have the black vote that has been suppressed. You gotta support those organizations. But that's why you elect people who have these issues at heart so they can push your police departments to do this. You're also right about the fact that it's hard to get traction without an episode. 
I think now, however, there have been so many episodes that the argument that you don't want to be the next Ferguson, you don't want to be the next Capitol Police, you know, is going to have more traction. And sadly, oftentimes, you don't get a lot of traction until after something awful has happened, but then you have to push for it and you have to push for the reform. And that's why it's important to also have people at the state level and the federal level who will support you in this. In this. It is not, it's not going to be the average citizen who crafts a resolution to a pattern and practice investigation. That's going to be the Department of Justice, you know, but the Department of Justice needs local partners with whom to work. And on this issue of defunding the police, you know, I think, I think we have, no matter how you define it or how, what you think about it, we have to understand the sentiment behind it. We have to understand the view and the perspective of communities that have been so over-policed without seeing any value from that over-policing that they are willing to say either defund or in many instances abolish the police because they do not see value in what police provide to them. So I think you got to, in my view, you got to step back and see what is the real issue here. And I think it is that we have so many communities, particularly communities of color, that always feel the burdens of law enforcement and never see the benefits of law enforcement that so many people take for granted in this country. And so how do you change that dynamic, regardless of how your police department is funded, if you don't change that dynamic, it won't matter whether they're defunded or overfunded, they won't be serving the community. And it's gonna require different things in different communities. You know, for example, I mentioned body cameras. Maybe the, your police department already has body cameras. Well, okay, who's your police chief? You know, are, are, they, are they someone who believes in community policing, who believes in de-escalating, who believes in limiting the contact and interaction between law enforcement and members of the community? Because a lot of what happens in over-policing is this, this desire, often directed by a municipality, to generate tickets, to generate fees, to generate fines. You know, there, these things are all woven together. Uh, and we have to recognize that fact as well. So, so I think, you know, I, I, again, I look at it as, what is the issue that you're trying to address? by defunding the police. Mm -hmm. And if in fact it is, how is you, whatever your public safety force is, whether it's large or small, whether you can defund it or not, are they truly serving the community? Yeah, I think that, I think I might've dropped out for a second. I apologize if that happened. Um, I think that's right. I, th I think one way to understand it is people are seeing, some communities are seeing the police accurately as not there to protect them, but there to police them and they don't see value in that. And that, has to change in my sense. But let me let me um, switch topics a little bit and, and hear what you think about social media. So social media has played a, a big a big role. At least you've gotten a lot of attention in terms of helping the the far right organize, um, yes. having having people become more extreme as a function of uh, engagement with things on social media. So do you think social media has a responsibility to police the content on their networks? You know, this, this, this is an ongoing debate, and, and certainly we've seen the far right use social media. I can tell you that in my work as a prosecutor, I've also seen uh, foreign extremists use social media. It is the main means of online radicalization of individuals who have gone on to uh, plot and plan and commit uh, truly horrific crimes. Um, and so everyone deals with it in different ways. And certainly when I was in office, had a lot of talks with my foreign counterparts about how to deal with social media. And <clears throat> what, I, what I quickly realized and what I think everyone sees is that different countries deal with it in different ways because we are one of the few that value free speech in the way that we do. Um, and so the, the challenge that we always have is upholding free speech and the, the marketplace of ideas, but also stopping it before it gets to actual incitement, which is a crime, which is uh, usually against the rules of almost every social media platform and can be stopped. And it actually can be stopped. It can be taken down. It can be pulled down as we have seen over the last week. Now this line shifts a lot. And so in my view, um, you know, I, in, I think that we have to look, view it as 
with every right that we have, and the First Amendment is, is a tremendous right. It's a reason why it was one of, the, one of the first ones promulgated. But with every right that we have in every other aspect of life comes a responsibility. You know, we, we don't get to do whatever we want, right? You have to think about- Well, some of us do. Some of us do, it seems like. <laughs> Not all of us. I, that's, I, I think that's true. That's definitely true. But at, at what point you know, do your actions impact someone else's to the degree that your actions can be pulled back? And that's the challenge we've always had. Social media has also been a wonderful tool for organizing in terms of social justice movements and protests and marches um, over the past generation or so. It, it has been, you know, Black Lives Matter started online. Um, and has and has grown into, you know, just a tremendous civil rights organization, primarily because of the ability to organize and connect online. We've also seen targeting of, of uh, civil rights activists online. We've seen the other side mm -hmm. of that. And so I do think there has to be more responsibility taken by social media companies. Um, they are private companies. They can, in fact, uh, enact policies. They have policies that are supposed to ban violent speech, criminal speech, speech that calls for the violence or the harm to other people. It's a question of pushing them to get them to use it. And again, you know, we, we've almost given them this quasi-governmental role because people sort of throw up their hands and say, well, how do we get them to do that? You know, how do we get them to change? We are consumers. Stop using them. You know, and, and it's, it's easier said than done for many of these. <laughs> it, it, it's, and it, it, it's hard. It's, it's tough when you build a brand around it and businesses have organized around it and they, they're woven into commerce. They're woven into our way of life. You know, it's more than just Facebook friends and sharing photos. Mm -hmm. It really is the way many small businesses advertise and, and find, uh, you know, find uh, customers and the like. And I understand all of that. But we have to decide at what point does our comfort and ease and our efficiency trump our safety. You know, we talk about the tremendous power that social media companies have. And yes, they have it. Do you know why they have it? Because we've all signed it away. We've mm -hmm. all agreed to these user agreements. And I will tell you that one of the frustrations that I always had in government when I was having this debate um, about you know the need to, for social media companies to 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 in fact be more responsible was people who would say well you know we don't want the big brother uh, eye of government on me and I would think you know you have willingly signed away more privacy to social media companies than I could ever get uh, in terms of information than I could ever get even with a warrant but people don't view it that way. You know, they view the government as all powerful and all seeing, and they think that, oh, well, you know, this is my personal stuff on Facebook or whatever, and that's private, and it's not. It's the most commoditized entity in the world today is personal information, and not just on the, the networks that you see, but on the dark web as well. And we have in so many ways willingly given it away without thinking. We have to make a decision. What's more important to us, the ease of sharing and, and the, 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 the right to say, oh, well, you know, I can lock all this and no one can see it, or, or having these companies accept some responsibility for the content that they pass through um, with the, the systems that they have built based on the money that they have made off of all of us. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a good place to end. I, um... I think we have a, a lot of responsibility. We have a lot of decisions to make, it seems to me, coming up here, not just in terms of how we use social media, but what's important to us and what we're willing to fight for in this country. I mean, I think that it's a, a really, we're in a, a very precarious time right now. And I think the points you've made about commitment to um, justice and participating in the system as a necessary corrective is, is right. So we will, we'll see how it, it plays out. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. And I, Please hang on, I wanna to talk to you a little bit more after this is over. Well, thank you so um, much for having me, Brian. It's been great. So our next discussion, will, <clears throat> excuse me, our next discussion will take place on Martin Luther King Day. Um, we'll talk to Ian Hanny Lopez, and we'll talk about the construction of whiteness and the role of white identity in politics. If you like this program, share the Leadership Society podcast with your friends. Thank you so much.